Hello, thank you for coming. I'm Nicole D'Alessio. This is Photoshop for kids of all ages. I like to consider all of us kids forever, at least a frame of mind. And I'm gonna be uh, doing some cool Photoshop things with you today. Uh, first, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and my journey and how I got here. And then I'm also gonna be talking about Photoshop and maybe how it relates to the core curriculum and some of the things that, um, that you can do, different lessons um, that coordinate with school. And then also I'll do some Photoshop demos and then I'll leave you with some resources at the end as well. And first of all, so I'm Nicole D'Alessio. You can find me on Twitter. And this is one of my self-portraits that I made with Photoshop CS6. I teach fourth grade in Pleasanton Unified School District. And I don't have Photoshop in my classroom yet. So I say that yet because I, I will one of these days soon. But I also teach at Foothill College in Los Altos Hills, and I do some community ed classes for middle school and high school students. And I also work with a really awesome guy over there named Rushton Hurley doing the merit program. So we do a lot of teacher trainings for teachers. And one of the things that I teach, along with a bunch of other cool technology stuff, is Photoshop. And this just happens to be the thing that I love the most and what kind of got me started. So it began a few years ago, um, and I wasn't necessarily a techie person, and I didn't really see anything that really interested me in learning. And I just, I was one of those people that couldn't get really excited about doing a, an Excel spreadsheet or whatever. So I pretty much just used the computer for checking my email and that kind of thing. Um, and then I started seeing uh, what you could do with Photoshop. So I'm just wondering for those of you, I know a few of you, uh, what, what grades do you teach? Are there any elementary school teachers in here? Okay, middle school teachers, high school teachers, anything else besides that? Okay, and how many of you actually have Photoshop in your classrooms? Okay, cool. So some of you do and some of you don't. And I also think that it doesn't matter even if you don't have it in your classroom as a teacher. I think it's an invaluable skill to have. So anyway, I set out on this journey where I was determined to learn Photoshop and I was told like, you don't need that, you're not a professional. It's, you know, if you're gonna be some graphic designer or something, professional photographer. But um, as a teacher, uh, I, there wasn't a whole lot of support for it, but I was determined and um, at the time, Adobe used to offer free classes for teachers. And so I went to these classes and I think they were really designed more for middle school and high school teachers. But I was determined to learn and I learned and I absolutely fell in love with it. And one of the other things that happened in my learning journey is that it helped me learn a lot more about myself. And as a child, I was very creative and I loved doing anything related to art. And then I think as you get older, you lose all of that. And it sort of just brought that back out of me. And I just realized how wonderful it was to kind of get back in touch with my little childlike self and, and that kind of thing. And I also started, when I first started teaching, I taught in Cupertino School District and I had only English language learners. And I found that there were, it was very important to be able to teach visually. So I think some of the skills that you have if you know how to create images or even videos are very powerful for teaching different groups such as English language learners. But one of the things that I learned as an English language learner is that whatever strategies that work well with English language learners are great for all kinds of people and all kinds of learners. So how many people here consider themselves visual learners? Okay, about mm, most of you. So I think that a lot of the things um, work for just about any population. And uh, so anyway, I show this picture too. Um, this is a picture of my twin sister and myself when I was a little kid. And I think that one thing we need to remember as teachers also is to keep things fun in the classroom. And I think it's so easy to get caught up in being stressed out about getting the kids ready to take these standardized tests and whatnot. But I think it's really important to keep learning fun and exciting. And I think also you have to find something that you're doing in teaching that makes you really happy and excited about teaching and learning as well. And that we can't underestimate the power of leading by example. So the other reason why I take this picture is that if you can see in the background, there's a photo of my uncle in the mirror as a reflection and he took photos. And so pretty much 90% of all the photos that I have of myself when I was a child was taken by him. And I think it, even if you're working with little, little kids, 
just by taking their pictures or using them along with what you're doing is such a great self-esteem booster. And I think it's almost like a form of saying, you're important and I want to remember this moment. So he, I think, made a big influence on me. And even today, we get together for weekends and we teach each other Photoshop tricks and, and whatnot. So just for them seeing you learning something and doing something that you really love. Um, my students are all so jazzed. Even my fourth graders, they want to learn Photoshop and they think what I'm doing is so cool. And so I'm always telling them about the new things that I'm doing. Um, just yesterday in our class, they were doing speeches, and a lot of them were terrified about getting up in front of the, the class for the first time. And I said, well, I do it all the time. I said, I do it every single day when I, when I get up. And I said, tomorrow I have to go and talk for an hour. And they were like, what? You're crazy? Yeah. So I think that's really good for them to see, too. And we have to remember that. So now I'm going to just kind of briefly tell about some different lesson ideas. And some of these things I'll be demoing, and some of them I won't. But I do have a lot of tutorials. And the other thing, too, that happened along this learning journey of mine with Photoshop is I started creating tutorials. And in the beginning, it was just because I would forget how I learned to do something. So I would make something, and somebody would say, gee, that's really cool. How'd you do that? And I was like, oh, I don't really remember. So I would start screencasting it just for myself. and then. I figured if I could screencast it once, then I would remember how I did it. And then I started putting my videos online. And then lo and behold, um, people actually started to watch them. And I thought that was kind of neat. It really kind of helped me to understand that idea of the authentic audience. And so I became really good friends with some of these people online because of some of the videos and the tutorials that I made. And Russian actually was one of the people that I met because he saw a video that I made. Um, and so Photoshop like turned from photo to video to a lot of screencast tutorials, and um, you know Photoshop was kind of like my gateway drug to that whole you know that whole little world there with video. Um, and the other thing too is that nowadays with Photoshop, not only can you do amazing stuff with photo, but you can do amazing stuff with video as well. Um, so one that I used to introduce when I'm first teaching Photoshop to people is called Scratch Art, and it's just a basic idea of teaching the concept of layers. Um, another project that I love, people who know me know that I have an obsession with black and white and silhouettes. So I do a silhouette project, and I have actually done this with very young children before, and it works great. And it's like a language arts lesson mixed in with the digital imagery. And they you know, pick some words to describe themselves, and they put that on there. All this in Photoshop is actually very quite easy. Um, and I do have an online tutorial on this. And um, the kids love it, and it makes a beautiful project for open house or back to school night or whatever. Um, the other thing, too, is if you're working with children and you're worried about protecting their identity, you can do these beautiful digital paintings um, in Photoshop that makes it really easy to turn a photo into a digital painting. And you can't really see who they are, but it's really beautiful. And the other thing, too, about using a lot of images is it's a great um, just kind of jumping off point for digital storytelling projects. So, if you take photos, you know, for me, it started with photos, and then it became photo slideshows. And then, of course, you can add audio and narratives and that kind of thing. You can now add audio in Photoshop as well. Um, and then also, I think that there's a lot of really cool things that you can do with math that relate to Photoshop. And then it takes those math concepts and puts it into a real life setting, which uh, are a, a lot more fun way of learning some of those things. Uh, there's three, you can do 3D objects in Photoshop now. Uh, in fourth grade, we study uh, the different plane and solid figures, and we have to memorize. There's a lot of vocabulary that they get tested on. But if they can actually create some of these shapes, um, then they, uh, they can maybe remember it a lot better, and you can do some fun things with that as well. So it's artistic and mathematical at the same time. Um, another one that I do is turning a photo into a kaleidoscope. And um, for those same thing in fourth grade and I think other grades along the way, you have to learn certain concepts like slip, flip, slides, turns, 90 degrees, 180 degrees. So they're using those concepts to create something beautiful. Um, and they're still learning the math standards at the same time. And, and, it, and it turns something that may be a little bit more of a boring subject to memorize into something interesting. So for me, when I was a little kid, I was one of those people that hated math. And I kind of got it stuck in my head. And geometry was one of them. And now. If somebody had taught me this in a different way, then maybe it would have just made all the difference for me. So um, the other thing, too, is that now in Photoshop, you can take still photos and put those image sequence into a video clip very easily. Uh, you could do this with time lapse, or you could do this with stop motion projects. Super easy. Um, and then also, if you're teaching children to use animation, 
you can do some very basic animation things inside of Photoshop where you're animating different objects. So for, for me, when I learned uh, how to do animation, first I was using Flash or something like Final Cut Pro, which is a little bit heavy duty for just basic keyframing skills, but if you do it in Photoshop first, it makes it a lot simpler and then it's a lot less intimidating. And a lot of those skills, and this is what I found from my own experience, transfer from Photoshop onto other things. And I think in a lot of ways, uh, Photoshop uh, does, it, does it even better. So I do have all these video screencast tutorials on Vimeo. And um, one reason why I love Vimeo is because it also allows you to download them. They're all free, so if you ever want to use them, you can. Um, and a lot of the Photoshop tutorials that I've, I've actually created have then gone on to win a lot of awards. Uh, one of the most recent things that happened was that I won the Photoshop Evangelist Contest. So I got to go last month to Las Vegas and go present in front of all the Photoshop people and like the actual, you know, met with all the product managers who create the software and I met the guys who in, invented 3D and they were like just so interested to see how I used it. Um, so that was super fun, super rewarding. Um, and you know, you just never know where it's gonna lead to you. So I think even as a fourth grade teacher, if you do have some photo and video skills, it's such a powerful way to enhance your teaching. And then also, you know, there's, I've had teachers from all over the world who have used my videos. And I once heard from a guy who was a teacher in the very interior of Bavaria and these woods in this little small town. And I did this one tutorial on how to make an annoying orange video, just like, you know, the annoying orange which is super fun. And then he did it for some kind of environmental video and they had the trees talking and he sent it to me. It was all in German and I had no idea what it was saying, but it was so rewarding to see that somebody else had used them. Um, and then you think of the idea of like, if you know how to create a video, not only are you teaching maybe the kids that might be in your class, but you're teaching other teachers. And if those teachers are then teaching your kids, the amount of impact that you have as a teacher is so much greater. And that was such a great epiphany for me when I realized that. And of course now the flip teaching is getting to be so popular. So you know all these skills are, are wonderful, wonderful for anybody. Um, and then the other thing too is if you, I'm gonna get into my demos really soon, but if you do want to learn more too, not only do I have my resources, they have this great social kind of network for educators called the Adobe Education Exchange. It's just tailored to educators, and you can go on there. And all the different teachers who use Adobe software submit their lesson plans and their ideas and their tutorials on there, and it's just a great place to, to network with uh, other you know, Adobe type of teachers. And then also, um, I have to talk about the Krauss Center of Innovation, which of course has changed my life, and I'm now a teacher there as well. So, super great um, place to, to learn. Uh, so first, uh, I'm going to start out with just like a very basic stuff, and we'll do some um, trickier things for maybe some people who are advanced. How many people here um, consider themselves like bare bones beginning Photoshop users? Okay, cool. And how many people are pretty good at Photoshop, they think? Okay, so we have a little bit of each. And the other thing to think about, um, some of the things that I'll show you, they're, they're maybe designed for kids, but they're fun for adults. And the other thing too is sometimes people go, oh, I. I learned myself doing something like that. So let's just say you're starting from scratch and you don't even have a picture and you just want to start with a new document. You can just go File, New, and you can just create like a blank sheet. Uh, most of the stuff that I wind up doing, I put on the web um, and then you can choose what kind of background. And I start with a transparent background. This size, 800 by 600, is ideal for posting on the web and I can just press OK, and I've just got myself a blank slate. When you see this checkerboard pattern, that means it's transparent. It means it's clear, so um, that's their way of showing you what the clear would look like. So here, over here on the side, I have a layers palette, and that's my bottom layer. So if you just think of, you know, back in the olden days, we had those old-fashioned transparent uh, transparencies, that's what it would be like. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to fill it with a gradient layer. I'm gonna be showing you how to do scratch art. So if you've ever done the physical scratch art before, you can really kind of visualize what it's about, and most kids have. On the bottom, you have that rainbow kind of colored layer, and then the top you have black and then you scratch stuff, and of course it's much messier than this. So over here is my toolbar, and they have 
a lot of different tools also that are nested underneath the other tools. And I would say when you're first learning Photoshop, it's really hard in the beginning and then you get used to it um, and it, it's a lot easier. But I'm gonna create myself a gradient and over here you have a whole bunch of different gradients to choose from and notice that I have a rainbow up here. Then I can click on my canvas and stretch it across and you get this beautiful rainbow thing. So that's my bottom layer for my scratch art. Then over here on the bottom of the layers palette, they have some other tools. And this here that looks like a little square with a little folded piece of paper, I can click on that and it creates myself a new layer. And if you want to be do this properly, you can name your layers by just typing in the names. So this will be my black one and this will be my, my rainbow layer. And I think this lesson is really good for just introducing Photoshop for the very first time. And one of the mistakes that a lot of uh, new Photoshop users use is that they, they get mixed up between what layer they're on. So basically this is a rainbow color on the bottom and then a clear transparency on the top. And now I'm going back over to this tool and I'm gonna go to the paint bucket. And over here are my color swatches. The square that's in the front is the one that the color that's gonna be the one that's gonna show up when you do it. And you can flip back and forth with these. You can also get a whole different color thing over here if you want. So I have black in the front and now I've got this paint bucket tool and now I'm dumping black paint on top of it. So if you notice now that painted black is covering up the rainbow so you can't see the rainbow underneath. So, but over here they have these little eyeballs so you can turn the eyeballs on and off like this. And down here is on the rainbow. But if I'm clicking on here and doing some stuff, you won't see it because the black is covering. So I'm on the black. And then next I'm gonna go over and I'm looking for the eraser tool. And then you can decide how big or small you want your brush to be. And if you want it to be a soft one or a hard brush. And you can also use the bracket tools to kind of make it bigger or smaller of uh, your, your brush. And then what you can do is scratch out a design and it reveals the under layer underneath, which is super fun. And kids, of course, love this. They understand the concept of scratch art. It's very simple to do. Anybody could do it. Um, and if you don't like it, I just press the delete key on my black. I was like, oh, I messed up. I want to start over again. Then I can go ahead and create myself a new layer, do the same thing again where I paint bucket. And then the other thing too is you can do cool stuff with, with text. So over here is a text tool and I'm gonna do the, the type mass tool and then I can click over here and I can type in letters and it looks red and then people start freaking out. They're like, why does it look red? Okay, that just means that it's a mask. And then I can press okay and I get these marching ads, which means that that's the selection of where um, I'm going to, to select within. And then if I take the eraser tool here and I scratch over here, it just masks out just that little area right here. And you can do, then when you're done, you can do select, deselect, or command D. And then I have my little cell, like a little scratch art design, which is kind of fun. So it's uh, basically that easy uh, to do that. Um, and now, I can close that one out. I'm gonna do one more little thing because one of the other problems that we have is we don't have cameras for everybody. So I love things that are just doing art from, from scratch. Um, the other one, this one is a math one and I'm going to put a yellow paint on the bottom and then I'll create myself a new layer. And in, in third grade, we still learn cursive. If anybody remembers cursive. And I'm going to write my name in cursive. Notice I'm using a Wacom tablet over here. I love these. I don't know how I would live without it. Um, and it, it's a lot easier once you get used to it to do a lot of fine details or drawing or doodling or that kind of thing. And so I'm going to make a cursive monster with my name in cursive. And I'm going to mix a little math in it too. So here's my name, Nicole. And um, I've actually seen though kids can do cursive really well with a mouse, not me, but the kids have no problem. And now I have this name here on the top, close the eyeball off, the yellow is underneath. And I'm going to duplicate this layer by holding in this layer down, putting it onto the new layer button. And now I'm going to flip this so like the mirror, the mirror image of it. So I can do edit, transform, 
and then flip vertical like this. And then with the move tool up here, I can just scooch that down like this. So now I have the mirror image. So I'm flipping something. These are all math vocabulary that we have to learn. And then I can also rotate the entire canvas. So if I do image, image rotation, and then we study 180 degrees, 90 degrees, what that counterclockwise. I can move it like that and I have myself a little cursive monster. I don't know if you've ever done this project on paper, but it's a lot more work. <laughs> so this is a lot easier to do something. And of course it's digital, so it's easier to share it than if it were hanging on the wall in your classroom. Um, and uh, you know, it's a lot more meaningful if, if students can share their work with other people than just the teachers, right? So. Now, here uh, is the silhouette. Uh, the trick with silhouettes is that it's going to be dark in the front and light in the back. So this photo was taken right inside of my classroom door jam. So it's dark inside the classroom, a little bit darker, and then the sun is shining behind. And you can also do the opposite. So if you are at nighttime, you're standing outside and there's a light on the inside, uh, you can do the same type of thing. And it works best if you have a non-busy background. And I want to first convert this image to a high contrast black and white. So I can go down here and choose the threshold adjustment layer. I love this button. You can do some cool things with that button. And I've just created an adjustment layer. So it's sort of like a layer, sort of like a filter on top of it. Um, and it's a little bit sort of like a mask. And um, the whole masking and adjustment layers is it's a little bit hard to explain in the beginning, but you start to get the idea of it. So I've just created this layer on top. And now I want to get rid of the trees. So I'm going to create a new layer because the other thing too, you want to, I would say one of the other um, good advice that you have to people learning Photoshop is it's really good to um, uh, create a new layer for everything. Um, and then I'm going to find a white paintbrush and I can make this brush bigger than it, what it is. And I'm just going to paint out the stray pixels that I don't want. I don't want those trees on here. So I just made myself a new layer. And then I want to add some text. So like I have the kids just write their name and some words to describe themselves. If you want to put it on the, the, the child's head, you can put it here in white, maybe. And go ahead and type the text in, and it's that simple. And of course, you can just keep repeating it. So super fun project in um, the beginning of the year. So I'll also show you some things that are really cool with CS6. Um, does anybody here, are they working on CS6 at all? Um, one cool thing that I should make sure not to forget to tell you, that all educators and students get up to 80% off on discounts on any Adobe software. You can also get a 30-day trial, and there was a, an Adobe guy here today that was handing it out. Nobody pays me to say this, um, but as an educator, you can get a great deal. Uh, Photoshop is actually quite expensive. It's about $1,000, so it still gets you down to about $200, so it's still somewhat, somewhat expensive, but I think it's well, well worth it. You can also get the uh, free month trial for $10. Yes, yes, so that's the other option that they're doing now, that you can just pay per month, and then when you don't want any more, you can do that. And that means that you just have access, and then you can... You still have to download the actual software to your computer, but then you do have access it for a certain amount of time. Um, so so I'll, I'll talk about some of the things that I really like about CS6. Um, and they've added some really cool filters. So um, if you go into, you can take a photo. And the other thing too that I like to do with photography a lot is use it to tell stories about the community. So if you're going around and taking photos of the places that you love, either you know if you're teaching local history or you know, California history, I teach US history, you can go around and take pictures of your community and then do cool things to the photos to make them um, visually appealing. And I think that also um, there's some value to taking pictures of the community too because it's sort of like a community building exercise. Um, but you can just put on um, the blur filters. They've made this so that it's like easy in one step. They have that tilt shift that's so popular now and it works really well if you're taking a picture going down. You just click on tilt shift and it creates this kind of like miniature blur effect. And you can you know, adjust these little, the little fields here by just kind of squishing this around. And then you can press OK when you're, when you're ready. And it creates that kind of little miniature effect. Super fun and super easy. 
Um, so here's one that I did, and then I added like little vignette to it afterward. And then also the other thing too, and I'll be showing you this more later, you can do some fun things with, um, with blurring effects too. And you can take a photo and turn it into a video. So this is one that's already been edited. But if you, you pay attention to this, this photo is going to turn into a video. Look at me and then look at my friend in the background. If I press play, you can animate the opacity of certain layers. So notice how the shift of the blur goes from me to her. So you can do some really fun, creative things with that. I don't know if you guys can tell from there, but I think it's kind of fun. All right, and the other thing too is that anything you can do to a photo, you could pretty much do to a video clip too. And it makes it a lot easier to learn. So if you've learned how to do some things in, in Photoshop with photos, then you can apply that to a video as well. And it's like the same process. So it's a lot easier to learn. So for example, I have a, just a very short video clip here. You can sort of see the flowers moving. Um, and then if I go to filter, they've got some, even, and they keep adding more filters too, because I think in this Instagram world where people are so used to, um, that's my other thing I love is iPhoneography. Um, these different apps that just apply filters on it. I think Photoshop is making things easier too. They have like, for example, an oil painting one. So if I apply the oil painting one, then I have some control over it. But I can turn a, a video of, a, of this into like an oil painting and um, it's pretty neat. All right, so here, um, here's a project too. I think that another thing to think about is that you can take projects with small children and you can modify them. Um, I often have my fourth graders working with kindergarten, for example, um, to do any kind. I do a lot of digital media stuff too. Um, and use the children's voices or use the children's photos or drawings. And it's really good for just building some of the background skills when you're teaching small children. Um, and, you know, if you could collaborate with some other class, it's really cool. The crop tool in CS6 is really awesome. You can, um, I just press this little crop tool and it's unconstrained. I love square and I think it's because I'm so on Instagram, I like everything square. But say I just want to make it look like a record album or something, then I can just press that little crop tool and you can kind of just adjust it. So it's like the picture goes under the little square thing like that. So it's pretty, um, really easy to crop. And you can, of course, play with some of the bl blur filters and little vignettes. And they have um, some added gradients on here. So that's something that I did on in, all in Photoshop. And then also down here, I want you to notice um, that I've got in the windows, you have different toolbars that you can open up or shut. And there's the timeline one that I have checked. So right here, I just have a simple photo. and. I think probably if you're going to be introducing video to kids, one way, or even grown-ups, like I said, one way is to take a photo and then turn one photo into a video and then maybe do one with slideshow. So you can actually do that in Photoshop now. But I just want to make a video out of one photo. Um, and you can just press create video timeline and it makes this photo into a video, like a timeline that you would recognize from you know, iMovie or Premiere or Premiere Elements or Final Cut or anything else. So you're teaching these basic concepts. And then I can add, I can make this longer. I can set my timing on how long I want this to be over here. And then Photoshop has also made it really easy to add transitions. So you can put a, like fade it out. You can just plop the little transitions on here. Maybe I can make the duration a little bit longer and then my photo, it just fades out at the end. And of course you can adjust, and let me make it a little bit shorter. You can just add this like crossfades and different things that are basic video editing skills and you're learning it right, right inside of Photoshop as well. And the other thing that I really love is that you can add audio inside of CS6. And this is something that's specific to CS6. All I have to do is press audio and then I can go into my, um, little files down here and add an audio track. And then it's really easy to, you know, trim the layers so that it matches. And then when I play it back. Hello, my name is Victor. I want to be a rock star and I want to play the guitar and I want everybody to sing my music and like my music and play it a lot. 
so you can you know, really easily add children's voices or you know, like I use this as a visualization pro project, like what is it that you wanna do someday, goal setting, that kind of thing. Um, super fun and easy to do. And all right. So here's another one too um, that this is a, I'll show you the final sample and I'll give you a little bit of demos on how I created it. But um, you can take one photo, turn it into video, you can add audio, you can add animations. And if you're a teacher working with small children, maybe you wanna use Photoshop to create learning content. So those teachers who wanna do flip teaching or whatever, maybe you wanna uh, create really creative instructional videos. So maybe you're just teaching preschoolers to count. So here's the final thing, what it sounds like. One, two, three, four, five. And uh, I did this in Photoshop CS6 with the content aware. So one of the things that I love about uh, Photoshop is that to me, it's just borderlines magic. <laughs> so uh, they haven't quite got to the point where I can say, I want Photoshop to read my mind, but they're getting pretty close. And it's pretty amazing to me. And I think that too in itself is really powerful when you're able to um, visualize something and then create it, uh, whatever it is that you're thinking in your head. And that's like a powerful skill. Um, and I think Photoshop is one of those things that helps you to do that. So I just have one photo um, of, and I, I also, I use a lot of my own kids so that I don't ever have any issues with people getting upset about me using their kids in the presentation. So here's my little, kindergarten boy, and I have one photo down here. Automatically, uh, Photoshop, uh, they have the, the background layer when you open up a photo. It's got a little lock there, so that way you, it won't let you edit the original photo, because they don't want you to maybe to protect you or to mess it up. Um, but if you do want to mess with a photo, you can double click on it, and then it unlocks it and turns it into layer zero. So. And this may be a little bit more advanced for some people, but I think the other thing too, when you're, you're doing Photoshop, it's like just to see what's possible, even if you may not be able to do that if you're just starting to learn Photoshop. And I can take this layer and I can duplicate it. And I've got two layers on top of it. I can't see the bottom one because it's the exact same photo covering it up. Um, but maybe what I wanna do is get rid of this truck. So on, on over here, I can take one of the selection tools and maybe I can just draw a, like a little lasso around it. So I'm just selecting this little area right here. And I don't know if you can see, can you see the little, they call them marching ants. So I've selected that part and I wanna say like edit and then I wanna to fill it. Maybe I wanna fill it. And then you can choose what you wanna fill it. I wanna fill it with content aware. And watch, you press okay. It's gone. Okay, so it's kinda of like magic. And I've just deselected it. Uh, the content aware field does not work with just any old picture. It does work with stuff with like um, repeating patterns, so like sky or sand or maybe a brick wall, it works really well. But it's kind of neat. So now um, I have the photo with none on the bottom and I've got one on top. If you wanna switch layers around, I can drag this one down to the bottom and I've got the one with zero on the bottom. Um, and then also down here, I'm gonna create my video timeline. So I've, I have these different photos layered on top of them, and we'll, we'll get more to that later. And then I wanna duplicate this photo again. So the content of where it first came out in CS5, and now they've added some more improvements with it. So now I've got one truck, but maybe I want two trucks. So over here, you see these two little like arrows kind of going back and forth. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick that tool, and then I'm going to just do a selection again like this. And I've got my marching ants again. But now I want two. So over here, once, the other thing too is up here, these menus change depending on what tool you're selecting on. So you can move it or you can extend it. So let's just say I, I don't like where that truck is. I just wanna move it over. I can just scooch it over maybe to the other side. And voila, the other one disappeared. It's like um, and the other thing too that I learned um, when I was first learning of, of actually anything with computer stuff with dig digital media, Command Z is your best friend. So if you ever make a mistake, Command Z to undo it. 
Okay, and now maybe I want to duplicate the truck instead of extending it or moving it. So I can press the extend tool and I can just push this over and I just made myself a new truck. And then I could duplicate my layer again and I'm gonna push it over, oop, Command V. I'm pushing it over again. What did I do? Yeah. Now I don't remember what I was doing. Anyway, I did it once for you, so now you can believe me. Anyway, <laughs> um, so the other thing too is um, using different layers, it's really easy to change the settings on the timing of these. So, um, and then also I can create a group with these so that it puts these slides consecutively. And you can do this with any sort of image sequence. So if I can do that, I, I selected all of them by just pressing the shift key on the top and then on the bottom. And then I can do new video group from clips. And then it's automatically put them in chronological order. Down here I can zoom out. And now if I wanna make this, so you know I have the bottom one with no trucks on the bottom, then I can just trim this like that and it automatically pushes the other layers right on there. So I know that sometimes with um, maybe video editing software like Final Cut Pro or whatever, you have some like little gap and it's a lot harder to, to make sure that you don't have any gaps in your video. So I can just set that one, make it shorter. I can set that one, make it shorter and so on, so that now when I play it back, and it tells you what the duration is as well. Let me just maybe nice and slow. And then I can just play it back, and then I see my trucks appearing like that. So it's pretty cool. And then if I want to add my text, I can add, I can use the, the text tool over here and maybe create, um, a number one. Now notice it automatically put the, the text at the end. I can press one over there and press OK. And then maybe what I want to do is to drag that layer up on top of the video group. And then I can scooch this over very easily so that it matches the part of my the photo over here. And actually I want zero there, right? So I want to scooch this one like that. So it's really easy, I think, to be matching up stuff like that um, with just moving the layers around and trimming them up. And I think that there's a lot of things that you can do in Photoshop that are actually easier to do in Photoshop than a lot of other video editing software. So some of the things that I do is I just kind of do my little um, pre little video clips first in Photoshop and then if you're gonna make a much bigger video, um, then you can assemble them later in another software. But some of the things that I'm finding, because I typically do shorter videos, I can just edit them um, very easily in Photoshop or if I do tutorials, I do some things in Photoshop first and then add the screencasts or whatever that I'm doing later on. And then you can, of course, add the audio and you can add uh, the little transitions. Um, it's pretty, you can also do the transitions in between ones too. So kind of fun and cool and I think especially if you're gonna be making any sort of like instructional video, that one's fun. All right, now um, the other thing too is that um, Photoshop, like what I love most about CS6, is it just keeps getting better and better with what you can do with video. And the other thing too is that uh, a lot of that grunge effect kind of thing is uh, getting to be popular. You can easily grunge up your video with Photoshop. So here's a, um, a final uh, project, a f sorry, a final product. Um, and this was some video footage that was taken in gold country. So kind of going back to what I was saying about taking pictures of your community or if you're doing anything with history and you wanna make it look old fashioned, maybe recreate something in the past. Um, another thing that we did, um, I also serve on the board for my local history museum as we did like an old time photo booth and you can take like photos and turn them into these old time slideshows or just take video clips and edit them. So I'll play this back for you. Super fun effects. Um, I, I pretty much, the other thing too that a lot of people are talking about is copyright infringement. 
my best solution for not having to worry about copyright um, problems is you create all of your own media. So if you know how to do Photoshop, you can. And the only talent that I, I just haven't gotten to the music part yet. So I got that music from a site called Incompetech by Kevin McLeod, which is a great resource for finding um, for audio for your projects. So that's the one thing I don't, I don't do is, is music. Um, but anyway, I just took a, a short video clip and made that. And so here's my original footage right here. And also, you may not want the audio for a certain clip that you use, so it's easy just to turn it off over here. Just remember that you turn it off, because earlier today I was trying to find out what happened to my audio. Um, so you can just click that on and off like that. But the audio here, I don't really need that. Um, and they've added, like I was talking about, they added some really cool new filters and different things like that are automatic. And you know, once again, the stuff that you can do to a photo, you can do to a video too. Um, and one of them that they did was they added some really cool gradient maps. Um, that are sort of like these old-fashioned film toning looks that's new to CS6. And the other thing, too, that I should say about Photoshop is that a lot of this, uh, there's a lot of more than one way to find things or to do things. So if you, you know, whatever works for you. So down here, they've got, um, you know, different a menu for different filters. But also they added this little thing up here that helps you to find stuff more quickly. So over here, you see these, like, gradient maps. If I add a gradient map here, it, it automatically pops up over, over here. Now, the other thing too, and I don't know if you can see this, but whenever you add an adjustment layer, which is sort of like a little filter, it will, uh, usually when you're working with photos, it will affect everything underneath that, all the layers that are underneath it. Maybe sometimes you only want it to, to affect one layer. Um, and right here, the default is there's that little square with a little tiny arrow pointing down. That means it's only going to affect the layer underneath it. But since I'm going to take this video and I'm going to splice it up and dice it up, I don't want to have to keep adding the same gradient over and over again. So if you uncheck this, then it, you don't see it over here either. Then it will go to everything underneath. But you can easily go through here and find um, a, a filter that you like. So I really like these little photographic toning ones that they made because um, I think they're really pretty and they make it look really old fashioned. And it's just super easy. Um, and that would be something like um, before, it would be a bunch of different steps with adding black and white to, to achieve that kind of effect. So there you have that, like that. Now, the other thing that I like to do is to use blend modes with photos. Um, and I can also do this to to um, videos too. And I'm one of those kind of people that I have this obsession with textures. So I'll go around and sometimes I'm just taking pictures of funny things like cement or um, cracked paint or different things like that. So I have myself like a little collection of textures that I use. And I also think it's kind of fun that, you know, if I'm doing one from Gold Country, maybe I want to find a texture that I've created, that I've found um, photos of inside of, my, um, inside of my environment that are nearby. So I can go ahead and say place a, a, a texture on top of this. And I took a picture of an old refrigerator at an antique shop that was nearby where this was taken. And notice the, um, the photo has been layered on the top here. And I can, I, if I like the, the placement here, I can just press the check mark. Now notice my, my texture is not big enough to match here. I can always change that. Um, and you can do Command T, which is a transform uh, key, which you can find over here. And then if you want to constrain the proportions of a photo, and I've seen people make this mistake a lot of the times, um, you want to press the Shift button down so that it doesn't stretch it. But maybe I don't care. So you know, you could. Just stretch it any way you want. But that's one thing that bugs me when I see these like distorted photos. Um, and I can stretch this so that it goes across the photo that I'm working with. And then I can press the check mark over here. And then I have this texture and it's covering up my other photo. And I can go over here and I have these like different blend modes that are here. And you have to pretty much play with them, with these blend modes. But the ones that are in the top little group, usually those are darkening them. The ones in the, and then these ones are lightening them. Um, and then 
Some of the other ones, I don't even know how to describe it. Sometimes they just change the color. You just have to try it. I like multiply. Usually if I don't know what to do, I do multiply. So see how that kind of created um, a nice little texture effect to my photo, to my video. And I see this isn't matched up right, but I can you know, easily like tweak these here. So then when I play this back, it has that kind of grungy look. So if you're thinking, gee, that, that looks really kind of rough and grungy, um, that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> and same with the music. Um, I wanted the, kind of like that old fashioned um, grungy effect to it. So now I have my, my video clip over here. Um, the next thing that I can do is I can easily chop it. So they've got this little scissors button here. It's, I can just place that on the timeline, make sure I'm selected on the layer that I want and I can easily chop it. And then I can always um, shorten it and then it automatically puts it together. So I got that little skipping kind of look that I, that I want to get. That's super fun. Um, and then also um, the other thing that I've done is that you can create um, brushes, customized brushes for, for your video clip. Um, and if you want, um, maybe I want to, you can use textures or um, you can use like just actual text. And maybe you want to look for some kind of old fashioned type over here. Maybe like this. And you put something like gold country. And sometimes I'll take pictures of signs and lettering and that kind of thing here. And maybe I can turn off these buttons down underneath here as well. And then if you, you take this, you can make customized brushes with a layer. So I can do edit. And this isn't something that's new to, um, to CS6. You've been able to do it a while. But you can define brush preset, and it creates a, an actual brush for what you're doing. So maybe I'm going to throw this away now. and I can actually stamp on the video layers with the brush. So if you go under here and go down and look for some of the, oops, I gotta put this on the timeline so that it matches it up. I've just created myself a little brush like that. And you can kind of grunge up your video like that. And then here too, I can do little frame by frame, little grunging stuff. Anybody here ever heard of rotoscoping? Yeah, so you can kind of do like little rotoscoping things. And you can, uh, you know, go like that, move it forward a little bit, put it like that again. So, oops, I moved out of the little time frame again. But then when you play it back, it has this little, kind of like that little grungy effect too. That's super fun. So I've just made brushes and different things like that. Let's see if I. And let's see. Okay, so another thing too, I'm showing you how to, um, if you want to open something up. I have, um, I do a lot of stuff with rotoscoping. One of the uh, video tutorials that I won that got me the Photoshop Evangelist contest was um, a tutorial that I did on rotoscoping. And I'm just going to play you just a short clip so you could see what it looks like. But basically, it's frame by frame animation and you're doodling on frames right here. So see how it gives it that little weekly look? And you can actually just frame by frame doodle on stuff. And, and by the way, with this video too, some people asked me, I just I recently made a tutorial on this one. Um, people say, oh, how did you get that like little dark effect? Because in the rules, I had to include a video of myself, and I don't really like to have myself in the videos. Um, I just put a black sheet over my computer and I put it behind me like that, so it kind of cloaked me that way. And then I added some, um, some black painting around the whole video layer too. So kind of fun, this thing's looping. So if you have one of those kids that you want to keep them busy for a long time, <laughs> set them on rotoscoping. No, I'm kidding about that. But um, it, is, it does take some time and some patience, but I think that the results are, are well worth it. So I'm going to open up um, a starting little video clip here before. And here's, this is me. And, and this one, I just put, I, like I just had a video clip of me in front of a dark wall. 
And if I play it back like that, you can see me. And then maybe I want to add the gradient, like that cool little gradient effect to me. So I'll, I can choose that. And I want like some really black and white effect that's, that's fun to the video. And then uh, let's see, this one is just affecting the layer below. Then maybe I want to create a layer that's going to affect the whole entire video. So here, I'm going to just push this on, on the top there. And I can drag this layer over the whole entire thing, like this. And then maybe I want to do a vignette. So I can just dump that paint bucket over the whole thing. I'll close that window out for now. And now you can't see the video underneath, but it's covering the whole video. And um, I can then reduce the opacity, which means the transparency of it, maybe a little bit. And then I could take the eraser tool, or if you knew how to do masking, I would probably create a layer mask. I'm going to try and keep things simple. And maybe pick a brush that's soft. And then I can kind of, I can just kind of maybe make a little brighter spot in the middle. And then I can adjust it um, as I want it so that it kind of creates a nice lighting effect that works for the whole video. And then if I want to trim this, I can easily just chop that like that and then chop my little video like that. Maybe scooch this over. So it's really easy to just move these different layers around. So I have a nice like a little vignetting effect like that. Now the other thing too is if I'm going to do frame by frame animation, I want to reduce my frame rate because I like to make things a little bit easier for myself. So typically when you shoot video, it's going to be between 24 and 30 frames per second. Um, I use an Icon D90, that one has 24 frames per second. But if I want to do rotoscoping, and here's a math problem for people who like math teaching. If I'm going to do rotoscoping and I'm doing 24 frames per second, I'm going to have to draw 24 drawings to get through one second. So if I have a 10 second video, we're talking 240 drawings. But I can make my job easier for myself. So down here, I have a little tiny button. They make it so small. If I go over here, I can look for my, my little document settings. So I can set my timeline frame rate. And right now it's 24. Maybe I want to cut my workload in half and do 12 frames per second like that. And then what I want to do is create myself a new video layer. New, new blank video layer, and that's going to be the one where I'm going to doodle on it. So now it's just automatically added this to the end of the timeline, but I want to maybe add it on the top. So what did I do here? I'm going to pull this one on the top. And then I can take a brush and pick maybe a nice colorful color like that. And maybe I just want to do like a simple little brush. And if I draw on this, it kind of really makes the colors pop. But I can draw that. And then that one, oh, I, that one I did for the whole, I did the wrong one here. Sometimes you want to do it for the, you want something to affect the whole layer, and sometimes you just want it to be part of it. I can create that. And then I advance one frame, and then I draw my heart again. And I can advance one frame and draw my heart again. And this is when it's really handy to have a walk on tablet. And of course, you can just keep doing that as many times as you want. Same process as I was doing with the other video when I did the little grungy video. But um, that doodle effect is. It's super fun, and of course it'll take a while, but um, you get the idea. So that's pretty much it for now. Um, you're uh, more than welcome to uh, contact me or stay in touch with me. I do have a contact information on um, these the slides over here if you want to keep in touch. All my Photoshop tutorials are on there. Is there anybody else with any questions or any else things that I didn't think about? Yes. Yeah, so, the, so typically um, the Adobe software is pretty expensive. The educators get to about 75 to 80% off discounts. 
So something like Photoshop would normally cost $1,000. For educators, you can usually get it for under $200. And you can go directly to the Adobe website, and I don't get paid for this. I'm not, I'm, I just think it's a pretty good deal for very powerful software that you could, I think to me it replaces a lot of other software. So for a couple hundred dollars, you could get CS6, and it has the video and the photos right into it. Um, and then if you buy bundled kits, like they have like the master collection or they have like the, you know, just if you want to do more web stuff or video stuff, it's a lot cheaper when you buy bundled packages. And I don't know the, the prices off the top of my head, but um, they're, they're a lot cheaper that way. And, um, and then uh, there's the creative cloud that you can just pay per month, like 20 bucks a month. 20 bucks a month, you said, for educators. And you can find it all from the Adobe website. November. It ends in November. Yeah. Oh, the good deal for the creative cloud. Yeah, so, and then in the meantime, you can do 30 day, 30 day free trials and you can just download it or they're giving it away over here. Yes, uh, Ken. Well, I was gonna share this only in reserve because Nicole and I are good friends and <laughs> talk about stuff because I teach uh, Photoshop heavy duty class, although mine tends to be more in the graphic design area and I do a combination of Photoshop and Illustrator. A lot of the, the steps and things that Nicole shared, I, I pretty much give my students a four week time period be able to do everything that's like you just did using all the shortcuts. Um, and like you said, control Z is one, yeah. three layers to control N. The faster, the more they learn those shortcuts, you literally take that workflow and you, you shave it down by, some of my students where it would take them like three days to do, it's gonna be one day, all just from learning the shortcuts. And it's really not, you know, Photoshop has what, 150 shortcuts. Yeah, there's a whole bunch. All you, all you need to know is probably about 10, and that will cover 99% of the project. And I think it's kind of like playing an instrument or anything else. You just have to practice with it until you get it down. But yeah, so yeah, thank you.